in to RBLR, the home of Tampa Bay's Reveler Sports. Hello to all my Rowdies fans out there. This is James Knowles coming to you from RBLR Sports and RBLR Rowdy specifically. Uh, we've got a lot to discuss today, so I'm going to get right into it. Leo, you are here. You are going to talk over this uh, dry spell, let's say, for the Rowdies with me. Uh, tell, tell me how you're feeling. Tell me how you're doing. Well, you know, I'm doing good, as in, like, my day is going good. But um, if I was talking from a Rowdies perspective, I'm not doing all that great. And that's, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, you know, that that's not how to describe it overall, but I'll just go with that. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, yeah, I can understand based on some tough results. So, uh, exactly. As we said last week, we were going to do a game that, or a show that covered the last two games this week. Uh, it was against Hartford on Tuesday. That was at home, and then it was against Miami on Saturday, and that was away. Uh, both of those ultimately turned into losses, and um, we got to get we got to get through a lot here. So, um, Leo, I believe you were at the first game. Why don't we start there? You let me know how uh, how the atmosphere was and all that. <laughs> Yeah, it was, I made my first appearance at Outlane Stadium this season, um, but the atmosphere was crazy, you know, and we had wonderful seats. We sat uh, a little bit behind to the right of, of the players where, where the bench was at, um, but just seeing the Ralph Small behind the goal, uh, you know, the energy was crazy. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. Obviously, it would have been a lot better if we had the win. We'll get more into that, what went wrong, stuff like that, but as far as the atmosphere and the seats and everything, it was, it was really, 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 really good. I haven't been at that stadium until like over a year, I think, and it just felt really good to get back, and I'm just looking forward to the next game I could go to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. the same for me. So, yeah, um, this was uh, Leo Fernandez's 101st appearance. It was his first home game since making his 100th appearance, so uh, there was a lovely big Tifa for him. I thought it was very slick. I liked uh, the work that Ralph's mob did there, but... Um, unfortunately, as you said, we could not get a performance to match the occasion. So why don't we get into that? You start us off here, and uh, I think that we have some predictions to read through really quickly before we get into our analysis. Yeah, I think uh, for the Hartford game, I predicted a 1-1 draw, and obviously I was wrong. Do you remember what you predicted, James? I gave a prediction for a 3-1 win, and uh, mm. I was also wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't remember what, what um, Aaron predicted, but I think it was somewhere between a 3-0 a, a or a 2-0 win. I believe, yeah, I believe he said it was a 3-0 win. 3-0 win. All, um, all of us. Yeah. No None of us got that right in the end. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, you know, we, we've been on a, on a, on a downhill uh, so far, just like the Rowdies, but we'll get more into that right now. Um, so we'll quickly analyze the first game for Hartford against Hartford Athletic. Uh Man, one thing I noticed from being so close to the field is how easily it was, especially Aaron Guillen, who, how you know, we all know how reliable he is, but Aaron Guillen and the other defender just could not deal with the long balls, and it was, you know, it, it seemed too easy. It's like they, they, they were hesitant of going in the air, or, you know, they just wouldn't even try at all, and that, you know, seems to be a problem for over, i say, a few weeks now. Yeah, I had that note in my, uh, well, in my notepad when I was uh, watching the game. I saw that, uh, that we were still having problems with that. This was something that we saw from the second time that we played Miami, and then we saw it out again here today, uh, or that day against Hartford. Um, it was a bit of a change in the lineup, so when Hartford got the ball at the back, um, Seb Sebastian Guanzotti, Dayon Harris, and Matthew Serbel was actually starting over Zach Steinberger. So that was something that we called for, and it did happen. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, as we said. But yeah. um, those were the players applying pressure. And uh, when Hartford had the ball at the back, they were able often to um, get these long balls off up to their uh, up to their forward line, who obviously were um, being marked by our defenders at the back, Forrest Lasso, Aaron Guillen, and Jordan Scarlett. They were not doing uh, sufficient work at the back. Now, I know that, you know, it's very hard to put pressure on a, uh, a defender such that he can't play a long ball, because when you're taught to defend, if you're under trouble, you know, that's the first thing you do, is you get rid of it. You knock it long. So, um, they can apply all the pressure they want. What they're mostly trying to do when they do that is stop uh, shorter passes. And then, if you have the ball as a defender, like I said, you want to play it long anyway under that situation. So 
if this is something that the rowdies can't handle, then that's going to be problematic going forward, and uh, it's something that we've had a lot of trouble with, at least in these last couple of games here. Yeah, that's you. I totally agree with you on that. You know, um, teams are trying to figure that out. They're taking advantage of that. And that first goal from Derek Dodson, who's on loan from Orlando City, that's how actually he gets that goal. Not necessarily a long ball, but a cross comes in, and it just shows that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, Aaron Gein just cannot get off his feet. You know, like he didn't make no genuine attempt to fight for the ball. And when you give someone, you know, we've seen Derek Dodson, uh, how he works around the box and in, in his uh, at the collegiate level he's doing the same thing on the usl level so far and he just you know to me it looked really easy him to score that goal and then the rowdies you know from there on they had no choice but to try to get an equalizer some kind of goal and although they didn't they had a numerous numerous amount of chances you know we seen Quinzati uh not scoring from close range uh steinberger coming on late in the in the first half not scoring from close range and you know it just seemed no matter how many opportunities we had in the box uh it wasn't going to click for the rowdies and it, it, you know for for rowdies fans i'm pretty sure it was really annoying um might be entertaining for a neutral fan but you know <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah you know you're just like watching all these chances not one of them is going in but uh credit to uh, jeff caldwell the the goalie for um harford athletic you know he made great saves although most of them were directed towards at him uh you know those reaction saves are were, were key for him that night and it was enough to, to see the clean sheet for his side and for, you know, the Rowdies to, to suffer a 1-0 defeat, which, you know, I'm pretty sure you could agree with me on this, James. But I think they had more than enough to not only get an equalizer, but, but win, win the match as well. Oh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it, honestly. There mm-hmm. were, um, you know, again, in my notepad, uh, over the course of the game, I have the missed chances in all caps <laughs> and i have that i have that multiple times actually like yeah uh, it started you know to get into um the the kind of uh progression of the game we st- we thought that we were off to a great start the rowdies sc- uh nearly scored in the third minute sebastian guanzotti you you know you wouldn't want somebody you would barely want anyone else in this league to be in the position that he found himself in in the third minute here, and uh, he exactly. is in the he, yeah he's in the six yard box. Seemingly the the net is wide open for him. There's just the goalkeeper to beat, and he did not. He uh, he put it wide. So um, maybe instead of looking that as a looking at that as a good omen, we should have seen it instead as a uh, uh, a, a, a an indic an indication of the rest of the game to come because that's kind of how it went for him we were under the impression though at that point that you know okay there's some good pressure coming here there's there's uh, a lot of good chances and the rowdies are looking pretty good to start you know they're doing their game plan and it's kind of executing the way that they had hoped and yeah. um then the next thing as you said you know we come down there were a couple of little things back and forth but uh you get into the 24th minute that's where Derek Dodson gets his goal Again, as you said, he beat Aaron Guillen in the air. That's something that I've seen uh, there turn into a bit of a problem here. Um, Aaron Guillen, as we mentioned in previous episodes, he seems to be very good in the one-on-one defending, and uh, I don't see him get beat very often on the dribble. But where he does struggle is over the over the top. And um, when Forrest Lasso and Jordan Scarlett, the taller players are on the other side. You know, that's something that teams can possibly try to target and I think that pop they might have been doing that with their long balls here um, there were some other instances that I saw that looked interesting where Sebastian Guenzotti was dropping really deep it was almost as if he was playing in the role uh, the number 10 role that Zach Steinberger and Matthew Serbel have been stepping into but um, that turned into a couple of different chances here and there where he was able to like I said drop back and then get the ball return uh, or a turn out or uh, to the to the left and the right, and when you know you get these players who are coming in to mark Sebastian Guenzotti, obviously the space opens up in behind him, and then the players that he passes the ball to can try and find those guys who are in that newly open space. I saw that work out a little bit, but um, the only problem was you know we didn't really have any chances for the game in between uh I, I don't know maybe 30 minutes to 70 minutes is that a, is that yeah. a good estimate is that what, what you would say <laughs> that's that's a really good estimate nothing really too dangerous or anything like that from the rowdies in that in that period of the game yeah the uh the mm-hmm. attack was down the middle in the beginning and then it kind of faded 
uh, towards the end of the first half and then coming into the second half that also really hadn't picked up. There were a couple substitutions as well. Jordan Adebayo Smith came on for Dahlgaard around the 60th minute. And uh, around that time, it was also that Hartford were getting a lot of yellows because of the, you know, just the way that they were playing. There was a lot of physicality to it. Um, they didn't seem to really want to even try to let the Rowdies, you know, build up anything because their their uh, chances had kind of diminished. They were doing those long balls that we mentioned, and um, it really wasn't leading anywhere after their first goal. So the uh, passing that we had really didn't turn into anything until we got much later on into the game, and there were, you know, a lot. There was a lot more urgency, I guess, in the last 10, 20 minutes because we were down, and uh, you know, you have to start pressing at that point. You have to try mm -hmm. as best you can. But um, that was also something that Neil Collins said when we got to the uh, after-game press conference. He told me that he thought that they were uh, lacking a little bit of urgency coming out of the half, and I think that you know everybody might have noticed that. Yeah, definitely. I think the whole stadium noticed that. There were um, people around me who were saying, like, we're not seeing the, 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 the usual rowdies, you know, like, if you're one zero down, uh, why are you, you know, playing the same way you did towards the end of the first half? You know, you need to show, like, some kind of reaction. And we didn't see that until it was, like, that desperate time of the game where, like, you know what, let's throw numbers forward, let's get an equalizer. But, you know, I feel like they just left a little too late. I think they should have put in uh connor antley a little bit earlier you know when, when he when he got something on the right hand side uh you know that's not that's nothing taken away from a day on harris i thought he had a good game as well but i feel like connor antley was uh he was getting by the the defenders more 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 quickly than day on harris was because he looked a little bit tired but i think um you know when you uh when you make that sub and i believe it was late in this in the around the 70 80th minute mark it was late late in that in that time period but um I think the Rise left a little too late to get an equalizer, although they had so many chances. You know, they just imagine if they did that starting from the 55th minute mark or the 60th minute mark instead of the 80th minute mark. You know, they could have had at least for sure one goal. One of them was bound to go in, but, uh, you know, it just couldn't happen. You know, we didn't see that kind of urgency until the last 10 minutes, and it was a little too late for the Rowdies. Yeah, um, it, it, was, uh, it was very frustrating to watch, honestly, mm -hmm. the way that it went. You know, all of these different confounding factors when uh, we're trying to attack it's it's uh yeah it's tough to watch as a fan of the rowdies but um yeah there were a lot of things that we just mentioned here that you know were kind of uh overarching patterns for the rest of the game i have yeah. in my notes here that the passing was often way too slow and you know that speaks to the lack of urgency um hartford generating very little in terms of the attack that was after they had got their you know first couple chances and then Derek dodson got the goal and you know when the when the system is working at least in the defensive sense that they're not getting that many chances you should be able to then turn it, turn it around and start moving forward in a more uh, in a more organized manner that you can turn these into chances and when you are allowing them to sit back like they were because they started with three at the back like we do and then uh, two full backs obviously on either wing and then the two central midfielders they had if you allow them to sit back then obviously they're just going to put as many men as they can in the box and uh, they're going to try and block as many shots as they can put their body in front of now that's not just that's not to um, take anything away from Jeff Caldwell as you mentioned he had a very good game and you know if we were giving an overall man of the match instead of uh, one specific <laughs> to the Rowdies I would probably have to give it to Caldwell after this game. I thought that, you know, he yeah. was... Uh, the other thing about being a goalkeeper and, you know, making saves is the first thing, obviously. But mm -hmm. the way that you make saves is that you have to be in the right position at the right time. You have to be able to judge where you need to be depending on, you know, what kind of shot you're going to be facing. So, Sebastian Guanzotti has his first miss in the third minute. That's something that we already discussed. He had several misses when you get into the last 10 minutes, just over and over and over with mm -hmm. his head and with his feet and off the knee, it seemed, and all of these things. And Jeff Caldwell was always in the right position um, to get on the end of it. Now, some of that does come down to bad finishing. You can't just say, you know, the keeper had an amazing game. He wasn't, mm -hmm. he wasn't any, uh, he wasn't having any like Superman saves or anything. It's just more down <laughs> to positioning. But yeah, um, Sebastian Guanzotti has to do better. But at the same time, um, to put himself in all of those positions, I think that Jeff Caldwell deserves a lot of a lot of praise for mm -hmm. uh, the way that he went about his goalkeeping that night. 
I, I would agree. You know, if there was an overall Amanda match instead of um, just the Rowdies, I would give it to uh, Caldwell as well. Um, like you mentioned, uh, just uh, the, his positioning and the reflex safety there that were really good. And for someone like Winzati, he does so many chances. He just, you know, um, maybe in a goalkeeper's head, you think, all right, he shot it here the first time. He might go a different um, direction the next time. But Caldwell just kept his stance straight in the middle, a little bit to one side, a little bit to the other side, and just, you know, plot every single one. I think the one I was most impressed with was probably the the um the, the attempt from Steinberger when uh, he takes the ball and, uh, in the box and he you know that shot from you know from my view I was like right there um he was uh it, it was low driven it was fast it was quick it looked powerful and he just parried that away and I thought that was really impressive it was, you know it was just one of those nights where it seemed like nothing was gonna work for the Rowdies and like you said you know um Cotto didn't make no uh amazing saves it was mainly uh positioning and also poor finishing from from the rowdies but man with all that being said you know they still suffered that one zero loss and honestly i think it's tough to really pick out a man of the match for the rowdies but you know if if, if we're gonna pick one out i would i would probably pick it out to uh uh sebastian guinzotti well, so this is the thing that we got to look at when we're uh, watching a game like this. You know, there are losses mm -hmm. where um, there's a team that is totally out of the game. So you go back to when the Rowdies played Charleston last, and Charleston was totally out of that game. They did not deserve to have any chances. They had really nothing going their way. I thought that the Rowdies only winning the game 1-0 was kind of uh, a detriment to us because, you know, it's not that it's not that Charleston did anything to help themselves. This is one of those mm -hmm. games where um, it was not like that at all. The Rowdies were in the match and they should have been on the score sheet. Uh, like mm -hmm. like we've said at this point, you know, it was mostly within the first uh, the first half of the first half and then the second half of the second half. There was a good, uh, well, maybe 45, maybe 50, 60 minute stretch within the middle of the game that the Rowdies were not really pressing to the point where they were um, you know, getting any any balls loose in a good spot where they could take a shot. They weren't creating any chances on their own through their system to do that. So what does it come down to? Um, the, the Rowdies did, in the end, have a lot of very good chances that were built up through the system. I think that the problem in the middle of the game was that uh, there was, as we said, that lack of urgency. But then you also take into account the substitutions that we made, uh, as you had mentioned. Antley Fernandez, Lakowiecki were all delivering these crosses. And that was after uh, the uh, Hartford team had taken off their main attacker. So Preston Tabor Tataka, he was you know, getting a lot of attention from our back line. And that was something that they had to focus on through that middle portion of the game. As much as the Rowdies weren't really creating anything going forward, Hartford weren't either, but they were always threatening to do so. That uh, attacker, Preston, he was, pre he was always on the verge, it seemed, of breaking loose. So they had to divert a lot of attention to him. He eventually went off. And that after that point, it seemed like the Rowdies could do whatever they wanted attacking. They were creating... Um, chances all over from both sides and the problem didn't seem at that point to be the system but of course that was only the small portion of the game that it turned out to be and even with all the chances that they had I believe it was 21 shots to 11 for the Rowdies at the end of the game you know that wasn't enough time to ultimately put one in the back of the net so it comes down to um, what is what is the system and when will it work so is is it's going to work against, you know, a Charleston team that's sitting back and none of their attackers are really working. That's good. You're not going to get that every week. Uh, it's going to work against a Hartford team that is sitting back and they don't have any of their speedy attackers that they usually have, like Preston Tabor Tataka, who is on the bench, or Juan Carlos Obregón, who is over training for the Olympics. Um, if that's the situation, again, you're not going to have that very often. Then we need to have something that's going to work uh, more than just the first and the last 10 minutes of a game. Yeah, definitely. Um, the way they approached those two games, you know, I mean, it, it could have worked for, for the Rowdies. We really could have. You know, if you put those chances away, and I mean, they had um, 21 shots, you know, five of them on target. But still, the, those 21 shots and zero goals to show for that, you know, um, I think the way they approached this game, uh, they, they could have easily walked away with the win. But... You know, just a matter of being clinical. If you're not clinical and you just, you know, give the other team, especially the uh, the, the opposing goalkeeper, 
uh, uh, confidence is just going to make it harder for yourself to, as, as the game goes on. And yeah, as we've seen, it's just, you know, I think, but I think James and I, you know, we, we, we both know that there's games like this in soccer where you could do everything right and still just not have one in the back of the net and it's just the way it's going to be. But what sucks for the realities right now is that, you know, that uh, that adds on to another to another loss. And then we'll get into it shortly, but, uh, you know, then they lose again to the Miami FC. But you know, I just feel like to have one of these th- these games right now where everything's working and then you don't win, it's just really bad timing for the Rowdies right now. It's definitely bad timing. The mm-hmm. idea that, you know, we have lost three games in a row, I, I don't believe that that's happened since 2018. That's not something that happens for a team that goes to the Eastern Conference Championship and is uh, about to play Phoenix in the final for the whole of the league, you know? That's just yep. not something that we do. It's supposed to be a better organization than that, and I'm really struggling to find out ex- uh, to figure out exactly what the solution is here because it started to fall apart a little bit more than just all of these missed chances. Um, mm-hmm. As as uh, we talked about, you know, there I don't want to keep harping on you know the way that the game went, but it really is illustrative of the way that the season has gone at this point you know the rowdies had their moments and those came at very specific times in the game but outside of those moments which were the first 10 minutes 20 minutes and then the last 10 or 20 minutes um there were long stretches where it was just kind of back and forth and they were going through this uh you know going through the motion so to speak it was you know trying this and then not really getting anywhere okay we're gonna probe over to the left side well we don't really have a lot of space over there let's pull it back and we're gonna try again and then we're not gonna really do much down the middle because as much as sebastian guanzotti's dropping back you know he doesn't have anywhere to turn to try and find somebody who has the quality to then add an outlet pass for him Mm -hmm. um it's this thing where uh it's not it's not Um, enough of an option. I remember before the season started, this has taken us way back, and uh, the first press conference that we had this year with Neil Collins, he said that he was very happy with the squad because it offered him a lot of different types of uh, options to try and score a goal. So, you know, we obviously have our plan A, but then we have our plan B, it's, it's like, and then we have our plan C. Um, So far, I'm seeing plan A and plan A and plan A and plan A. When plan A doesn't work, we're just going to keep trying it. And sometimes it's going to (laughs) work, like when they don't have the attackers to give us problems and everybody can focus on going forward. But most of the Mm -hmm. time, it's going to be a problem because, um, you know, the Rowdies are are kind of a a known quantity at this point. Um, It was in the game that within the last 10, 20 minutes, the Rowdies switched up to a 4-4-2 position. And apparently, according to Neil Collins in the uh, post-game press conference, he said that it was more so the impetus that the players took as opposed to anything that he told them to do that they got into this position. You know, he took Forrest Lasso off, and uh, if that's the case, then you know you can you are obviously focusing on um, getting the getting the attack. Uh, or getting a lot more of play in the attack and trying to, you know, just cut out the middleman, so to speak. Forrest Lasso Mm -hmm. does a lot of passing out of the back, and if he's not there to do that, then it's just going to be lumped up forward. And uh, maybe that's just part of what they need to do if they're looking to get all these crosses off. They have a lot, they had a lot of success with those crosses in terms of creating chances. And, you know, if you have 21 shots at the end of a game, it's kind of a fluke when none of those go in. So maybe it needs to be looked at that all of the chances that we created, how did we how did we really do that? Was it the case that we were doing the same thing that we always do, or was it the case that Forrest Lasso, along with the other substitutions that had been made, including uh, Preston Tabor Tadaka getting taken off, all of those things led to us having a lot more options moving forward. So if that's what is the case, and if that's what leads to all these crosses, then we need to recreate those conditions as best we can. And the way that we do that is X, you know, maybe we just start with four defenders instead of three at the back and two wing backs. Maybe we have it with uh, more of the players who came on later in the game. I'm not entirely sure what the answer is that, to that, mm-hmm. but uh, it's just, it's a very, it's a very poor inflexibility that I've seen in these last couple of games, even when, you know, the chips are 
uh, all the chips are on the table and we're about to lose a game. <laughs> It, it all it, yeah. it comes down to the players saying, "All right, this is what we're gonna do. This is the this is the tactical shape that we're gonna get into um, to move mm -hmm. forward and create these chances." And yeah. uh, if it comes down to the players to do something that then creates all the chances, I just I, you know I'm not sure what to say there. <laughs> yeah, one one thing I would say before we move on to the Miami FC game. Uh, you know, we got to consider that the only reason that the Rowdies, well, one of the main reasons why the Rowdies have so many chances is because, one, they, they, they concede first, you know. So that puts you in a position, you know, like like a, a really crappy position where you, you, you can't just sit back and, and uh, um, uh, think about the game or, or, or take on the game in, in, in a calmly matter, you know. You have to, now you have to score, you know, where before if you're tied zero zero, like you just play your game. That's but right. now you have to score, you know, because cause the Rowdies have been conceding uh, the first goal, uh, multiple occasions now, and you know now they they had to have that urgency of you know um, we have to score or else we're gonna lose you know and and if we score, we're tied one one and we'll still draw points so we gotta get another one so then that leads to you know like like a double desperation, I guess I, I would call it that. Um, but yeah, so you know you talk about all the shots they had, all the chances they had, but that in you know, that let that it became that urgency from the Rowdies because they put themselves in that situation. You know, just like the Miami FC game, we'll get more into it. But um, you know, that, that that mistake from Connor Antley, now you put yourself in position against a rivalry team away from home where you have to score. So you know, we we, we see a lot of shots because, um, I mean, some of them are desperate attempts. Some of them are just you know what we're losing. What the heck? I'll just shoot it over here. It might not might not go nowhere near a goal. But yeah, we see this. Exactly. Be yeah, we see this because they concede that first goal. Not only concede the first goal, but you know they concede it early in the game. So now you have the entire game to try to score, but yet you still play in a calmly matter to where you're thinking, you know, it seems like as if the Rowdies are still tied 0 0. Like, no, you know, you need to um, start getting the ball more, um, get possession. If you could counter, great, make it efficient. But if you got possession of the ball, you know, continue that side to side play that, that you've been doing that's been success to, to, to getting wins. But we haven't seen that lately. Um, and, you know, it's just, you know, like that, that considering that early goal is just what, what's been killing them lately. Yes, absolutely. That is a big mm -hmm. problem. So that goes into uh, what we started to talk about a little bit in terms of there being more than one problem on the field. In the past, mm -hmm. it's been the case that the Rowdies are the best defensive team in the league and they are conceding the fewest goals, uh, so on and so forth. And um, I think anybody who looked at the tournaments, the international tournaments that were going on the last couple of weeks, uh, you can easily see one thing that really wins games and you know, especially in tournaments where you are trying to, you have to win the game or you go home. Um, the Rowdies are kind of getting into that, you know, space right now. But um, to get back to the point, it's that defense will win you games. If you don't concede first, if that is your goal to start with, don't concede. Then you can worry about other things afterwards, you know. It's, it's the case that uh, it's been said, at least, about... Uh, England, they were trying to always not or, or not ever give up a goal first, and then they move forward and they decide, okay, this is an attack that's worth doing, but not if it's going to give up a goal here. The Rowdies in these cases have been giving up a lot of chances that ultimately, you know, come from these poor attacks or or just the long balls, and the defense is not sturdy enough to hold those up. And uh, if they are giving these chances away, then as you said, yeah, you're chasing the whole game. And if you're chasing, then you're going to put yourself in vulnerable positions and possibly give up more goals. So far, they have not given up, you know, a bunch of goals in a game. Um, they've given two away to the Miami in the loss there. But um, it, it's all it's all factoring into the way that they have to go through the rest of the game after the first goal. These early ones are really hurting us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you just said. And, you know, I just think that if we do find a way to stop conceding first, but also, it's not only just conceding first, it's also the way you start. You know, it's like lately we, we've been had, we've been letting the other team uh, uh, start with possession, you know. And if you start with possession, you feel as if you're the dominant team and that gives them more confidence. So if you're the Rowdies, if you're the Rowdies you know, you got to keep that ball uh, for longer periods of time and, and not only early in the game, but the majority of the first half to, uh, you know, to to create some kind of opportunity. And even if you create the first opportunity, and you don't score, you bring that confidence in the team. We're like, you know what, we did it once, let's do it again. It's working. You know, we'll, we'll get a goal. 
but that's something that's just been lacking and honestly it's been lacking ever since uh dodo santos has, has been out but I, I i don't know uh when um because if you look at the defense and someone like aaron Guillen, i know i've been taking a lot a lot of hits at him but I, I'm, I'm just seeing what i see on the field you know like a long ball like that last season you see him you know it's not even a problem for him at all i think for that whole defense a long balls you know that's not even a problem Cassini first, they probably don't even know what that meant last season because they yeah. were just so good, you know, at, at, at um, preventing any kind of danger. But now as if, you know, you get a little shaky now when when, when another team uh, uh, presses against the Rowdies, you know, you're not you're not as, um, how do I say, you're not as confident uh, uh, for the Rowdies defending any kind of situation. And, and unfortunately, it's just the way it's going right now. And it might not be on the defense entirely because – you know some of the balls you know as for instance the, the miami fc game um the connor antley mistake that didn't come from the defender so you know sometimes they they, they shoot themselves in their own foot and he just you know it's, just, it's, a, it's a mistake but it's a huge mistake that that uh that can cause uh, a loss in the game yeah so mm -hmm. um at least for the hartford game i think we've beat this one to death a little bit here you know we've gone over the pattern of the game and the patterns of play that led to that overall uh, arc in terms of the timing for everything and uh, let's let's move on here we probably rambled enough about how yeah. <laughs> the Hartford game turned into you know a whole bunch of shots with a whole lot of nothing in the end it's a part uh, that we did though <laughs> yes exactly exactly Leo you said I believe that Sebastian Guanzotti was your man of the match is that correct yeah I just you know although he missed a lot he just looked like someone who who was uh i guess hungry to get that equalizing goal and you, you can see how much it meant to him when he did it uh after the game the way he had his head down on the field so i would just for his commitment out on the field i would just give him the match well i uh, i can appreciate that but um i'm gonna say for me personally leo fernandez i think was the person mm -hmm. who was creating the most chances in fact i believe he did create the most chances in the game he was mm -hmm. uh it was his 101st appearance you could tell that he really wanted it back in front of the home fans and uh in front of the the tifo that in his post-game pre press conference he said was better than sebastian guanzati's for the same occasion yeah. but um <laughs> I, I i thought that was pretty funny but uh i'm gonna have to give it to him personally and um so i i just want to get through one quick question before we move forward here um you know the the thing that you have to look at as i said with this game um, the system, is it working or is it not? You have these chances where uh, in the latter half of the second half, you're getting, you're just getting literally one every minute. I have 70th minute, 74th, 77th, 83rd, 84th, 90th, you know, it goes on yeah. like that in my notepad. And um, what's, the, what's the difference between that and where it goes, uh, these long stretches of um, you know, just notes in here where I'm like, okay, it's the 60th minute and they're making a substitution and it's the 63rd and, you know, somebody else for Hartford gets a shot and then it goes all the way like that. So what's the difference here? Um, like I said, Forrest Lasso came off and that changed up the formation when the players went into a 4-4-2. The Rowdies do play in a 3-5-2. But usually the way that that switches up is when they have possession, it morphs into a 4-4-2 anyway. So there are other differences here, and that also depends on uh, the players that Hartford had out on the field. So as we've mm -hmm. discussed, um, just want to really briefly reiterate that they take off Preston to Port Tataka. He was their most uh, threatening player up in the attack. If you have this system where you can focus solely on attack, sure, the way that the Rowdies play seems to really work then, obviously, you know, if, if that's what you uh, are facing as an opponent, then you can kind of do whatever you want. But as many chances as this game created in the end are 21 shots that we keep coming back to. I don't think that this is a good enough representation for the system to say that it is working for the Rowdies to move forward. Um, lots, of cha lots of expected goals. Uh, that's a stat that is measured commonly for, you know, how a team is doing overall. Are they creating a lot of chances? Even if a, a lot of goals don't go in, if you have a lot of expected goals, that usually means that eventually you're going to do well. But we haven't seen it turn out that way here. And uh, when you have 21 shots and none of those go in, you kind of have to think, okay, so there's something else going on here. 
And uh, it's not just for this game either, because that's kind of been a little bit of a pattern over the last couple. There's something mm -hmm. that we need to look at deeper. So for all of those reasons, if we're having all of these chances and they're only coming in this way, uh, then uh, this way in terms of uh, the way that the game is set up and the way yeah. that we're getting our chances and uh, the players who are on the field for those chances, then you have to say that, no, it's not working well enough for us to continue to do it. So uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's just one I wanted to point out. Um, I got a little bit of flack on Twitter. I think it was uh, last week I said that, you know, um, the teams that have played the Rowdies a second time have all beaten them at this point. And that's true. I said that I didn't think that that was because they were figuring out the Rowdies. So just to clean that up very quickly before we move on. Um, figuring out the Rowdies is something that I think has been done. I just don't think that you have to play the Rowdies to do it. You know, obviously it helps to play them, but there's a lot of footage going on, and these teams all have coaching staffs that are going to analyze it endlessly before they play the Rowdies. I think that the figuring out how's occurred, I just don't know that you have to play one game to do it. Right now, all you have to do is see one game, and you know what the Rowdies are going to do for every single one for the rest of the season, the way that it's gone. We've got to switch things up as is what I'm really hoping to see, and I just don't know that it will come, unfortunately. You, you, you mentioned that you don't know if, you will, if it will come, unfortunately, and I have to agree with you, you know, and we'll get later in that in my hot take. In, uh, I say something along those lines, but it's true, you know, and I, I like the point you made where you say you don't have to uh, figure out the rowdies. Uh, you, don't have to, you, don't, you don't have to figure out the rowdies to, to win against them, you know. Like, teams uh, uh, already figured them out, but as long as they just sit back, or even just get possession and get that early goal, then you have the Rowdies, you know, trapped. And now, now they have to throw numbers forward, and that just would killing killing them. That lately, we've been saying it uh, uh, over and over again that 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 early goal they they they, they tend to concede recently it just just kills them. Yeah, yeah, it's the mm -hmm. early goals that have been doing it, and it's the way that our attack lines up that we can't get enough quality chances to mm -hmm. um, put the goal away so, or put or put our shots into the goal. So. Yeah, that's, that's um, the overall game for Hartford, and with that all said, we're going to move into Miami, where unfortunately we saw a lot of these things happen again. You start us off because you mentioned it already. We had, uh, we had probably one of the worst goals that the Rowdies have given up in the last three years happen. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, Connor Antley, like, with, with a huge mistake, it's just, you know, it, no, I wasn't mad. At Connor Antley, I was I, I I kind of felt bad because, you know, I think everyone was shook when he just passed that ball back and you just didn't expect it. And you seen his reaction when once uh once um once uh Miami did did score uh, off of that mistake from Connor Antley. You know, he just had his head down. You know, he I, I know for a fact if he could take it back, he would. But I just felt bad for the guy, especially because he had, you know, in, in, in that in that 10 to 15 minute cameo he had uh, against Hartford. I was really hoping that he would have a good game and prove that he should start because he, he hasn't been starting lately. And um, uh, and that doesn't help his case at all because I believe he got subbed out after the first half. And one thing I noticed about Connor Antley is that at the end of, at the end of that first half, right before it ended, um, I uh, saw so someone pass it to him and he tried to control it by, by doing like a slick uh, back heel stop. But. It just totally failed. It, it went straight through his uh, legs. It just went out of bounds, and he just he was just lacking all sorts of confidence. And you know, it just just led to that that it started off because of that uh, that, that huge mistake he did. And honestly, um, it's not to blame Evan Laurel off of this because I know it wasn't his fault. But you know, I I, I don't think he should have came out on that one. I think you know because. Uh, you had Jordan Scott and Forrest, Forrest Lasso there. You know, the reason why Forrest Lasso runs back is because Evan Laurel comes out. You know, if you, if, I think uh, uh, there was time, not a lot of time, but there was certainly time for Forrest Lasso and Jordan Scarlet to, to try their best to, for, for, um, for Miami not to get that, the Miami not to get that early goal. So I, I, I just, I don't know if you agree with me on that, James, but I think Evan Laurel should not have came out on that one. You know, uh, it's it's difficult to say. Um, I, I think that under the circumstances, you know, he was the he was the person who could have gotten there first, and yeah. uh, he certainly made those saves. Like I wouldn't say that he is a bad goalkeeper at that kind of um, that kind of play, where you know you get mm -hmm. your hand just enough on the ball to knock it away from him and give yourself some time to get the defenders back in space, all that kind of stuff. Um, it could have gone either way, uh, but. 
unfortunately, obviously, in this case, as you as you noted, it did not work for us. Yeah, it didn't. And, um, but uh, you know, after that, uh, Miami still continued to dominate. But we seen because uh, from what I seen in that first half, it looked like although Miami did have most of the ball, it looked like Rodgers were trying to approach it in a professional manner, as in they're going to sit back, that Miami had position, and then attack on the counter. You know, and I, I, in that first half, they really had two chances. I think Lawrence White cuts inside and hits the post, and then um, a cross comes in, and Steinberger uh, misses from close range. So, you know, you had these opportunities, and if you score those two opportunities, you're up 2-1. And, you know, and, and when you have an attacking side with Dal Gonzalez there, who's your leader up front, um, you, you, you have to score those goals because, you know, they won't come often, especially against Miami FC team that's, just been on fire recently you know they haven't lost a game i believe in the last five i think uh but so you know when you get those chances you have to score and just imagine if they score those two goals and connor Anley doesn't make that mistake you're up 2-0 i know it's a big what if but you know uh, they have to think about this you know like you have to score when you have the chance and they should have learned from that hartford game that you know you missed so many chances that game you come into this game and you miss two more to to equalize or take the lead um but it's those. It's not being clinical and it's making silly mistakes. That's, you know, because we we talked about the mistakes right now for for the Rowdies is conceding early, and although that 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 goal they conceded against Hartford wasn't really a defensive mistake, this time it was. So you know now it adds more problems to what's already, uh, uh not been a good run right now for the Rowdies. Yeah, you mentioned confidence, and that's something that I kind of want to harp on here. Mm-hmm. Um, the way that I saw the first half. And I, I guess that I'm going to have to be super harsh about it. I thought that that was one of the worst halves I've seen the Rowdies play this whole season. It was, it was, it was really very poor. So um, just to get into it a little bit more in depth, uh, we had you know the same back three in Aaron Gian, Forrest Lasso, Jordan Scarlett. Obviously, Evan Loro behind them. We had Leo Fernandez and Connor Antley on the, on the uh, wings. And then in between them, we had Lawrence Wyke and Lewis Hilton, the two Englishmen in the midfield, with Zach Steinberger back in the uh, number 10 spot. And then we had Jordan Adebayo-Smith and Dayon Harris starting up front. Sebastian Guanzotti was not starting, which I can understand in terms of giving him a rest, because uh, in the first in the first game that we covered, Hartford, Zach Steinberger is our usual starter at the number 10. He did not get that position because uh, afterwards Neil just said that he needed a rest. That was you know, something that um, he's been playing so much that he needed to uh, give him that bit of a break and then take some freshness uh, when he comes on the field and apply that to some probably uh, more tired defenders towards the end of the game. And I think that that was the idea with Sebastian Guanzotti here. Let him you know, get some time, build himself up, and then when the, uh, when the other team is tired, Uh, Then you introduce him and you get some more speed. But we didn't even get to that point because we were already down 2-0 by the time Sebastian Guanzotti comes in. It was really, it was just the poorest half I think that we have had in a long time because all the players who were on the field, everyone that I mentioned, it was just, it was disjointed from the beginning. I thought that uh, Ariel Martinez, a, a player for Miami who's in his 30s now, you know, he's not... He's not an old. He's not uh, an old old guy, but he shouldn't be dominating at this level, I think. And he just had a, a absolutely spotless performance. He was all over the field, and he was direct in traffic. He was sending Miami on all of these fantastic chances and runs. It was it was really weird to see how poor we were doing defensively because. Again, they had, you know, I think one player up top, it was the same, it was a roughly the same that they had before. They had one player up top sitting on Forrest Lasso. They had Ariel Martinez behind him, and then they had two attackers uh, playing off of those, uh, playing off of those two in the middle. So Othello Baugh, he was up top, and uh, I believe it was Pierre Da Silva, who were the two winger, like, off to the side players, not necessarily wingers, but... Um, they were the ones that were supporting Ariel Martinez and uh, the striker for Miami up top. And those two were all were always there to give Martinez an outlet. But the problem before that starts, Martinez is open all of the time. 
you have uh, in front of the back line Hilton and Wyke, and they are not communicating with the back line enough to make sure that Ariel Martinez, who is having this massive game so far, is always covered. Um, that's not good enough. And what does that come down to? I'm not really sure at this point because, as we've mentioned, um, the defense is usually a very strong point for the Rowdies. If I'm right here, and this is pure speculation, as with everything we do, you know, we can't get into Neil's head, we can't get into the players' heads, that's um, not possible from our vantage point, but I'm thinking that there's just a real lack of confidence going into this game, and especially, as you mentioned, with the early goal. We go down 10 minutes in, and then the players all of a sudden, you know, their heads are down, they're not, they're not sure what they're going to do next to try and go get the game back. Then the next thing, we go down in the 34th minute. Um, it's 2-0, and after that, what, you know, what way back do we even see? I feel like that's kind of how the players were working, and uh, the confidence levels that we're looking at are just so low. Ariel Martinez has all the time and the space in the world because there's nobody doing their job properly, and that's because you're focusing on the wrong thing. If you're confident, you're already going to know what to do. You're not even going to have to think about it. That's just the kind of zone that all professional athletes want to get into. Nobody was in that zone today. They were all they were all questioning themselves, like, okay, do I need to go here? Where do I need to go next? Um, what what ball should I play? Um, what should I do? Um, like it's it's. It's second guessing, and I feel like that's what we were looking at with the Miami game. Ah, uh, yeah, well, I would totally agree with you on that. Um, the, the point made about second guessing, you know, it's like uh, sometimes they were hesitant, you know, especially out about Smith. He didn't know which run to make, uh, when should I draw back, and you talk about um, the the lineup, and we received a comment from from Twitter, uh, from at Rowdy's Rap. You know, he said the starting exit was a disaster. There was no urgency or confidence at all in the first half. And I know, James, you pointed that out already. I'm pretty sure you have you have at least one person who agrees with you. Now, actually, you have two people because I agree with you as well on that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was just, you know, all sorts of mess in that first, from that, from that XI in, in the first half. Um, and that, that second goal that Miami conceded, you know, Jordan Scarlett, he, he, he's, he's, he's supposed to be tracking that, that runner. And I don't know, for some reason, instead of staying sticking with his man, he has to run towards a near post. Yeah. You know, yeah. When, when, when you have Evan Laurel, who's already, you know, positioned well, and you have um, a Forrest Lasso behind you to clear of any danger in the center, there's no reason for you to run in that first post. Stay with your man, you know, uh, get, get that clearance out of here. And that dude was just by himself, so much space. It was a good finish, but he shouldn't even have the ball in the first place. Like, like if you get if you get beat, by by uh uh, uh the silva on on the left side and he crosses in okay that's fine you got beat you're a defender you're gonna you're gonna get beat but for someone we know i might seem like i'm you know going i'm i'm being harsh on jordan scarlet but we all know the level he's capable of playing you know we made a point the last episode that he should be caught up for the jamaican national team so i think you know it's 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 a valid uh reason to to um say that that second goal was you know he 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 would he should have been the man to not to prevent that second goal is what i'm trying to say you know uh he should have stuck with his man it would have never been a second goal and now the rowdies two two zero down in the first half and they're in all sorts of trouble and um you know uh getting to that second half we, we have a question here again uh, uh if you want to ask any questions for us uh just on twitter you could use the hashtag ask rblr or um you know uh tag us in any questions and and we'll, we'll be sure to answer it and we have a question here from at carlos uh tpa 10 uh carlos here asked what was it about the first half lineup versus miami that made it feel so disjointed and my answer to that is although we conceded two goals the back line well the captain of the captain for that match was um forrest lasso so they have a leader in the back our usual captain is um sebastian guanzati and he's a he's a leader in attack you know, and the only leader we really had up there was Leo Fernandez, but, you know, he's worried about his left-hand side delivering crosses. You know, he's only worried about that side. But the reason why we see Sebastian Guazzotti, whenever he starts drops deep, is so he could communicate with others, help others, you know, understand the rhythm of the game. And we didn't have no leader in the attacking side, and that's what led to, heads, head, um, you know, players being hesitant up top, uh, not creating many chances. That's why when we see when he came on, something just ignited in that team especially in, in the attacking play so for me i think that's that's what was the difference well what do you think james 
Well, I inadvertently answered his question uh, earlier with what I think, but yeah I, yeah, I would have to go back to the you know the confidence thing. We've hit on this already several times in this episode, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's the case that the Rowdies are in a rut right now. Everyone's obviously aware of that, and then it's also the case that the Rowdies are giving up early goals right now. Early goals have really turned out to be a, a big problem for us, and if we're giving up these early goals, then... Um, you know, when that happens again and again and again, your head is going to drop. And when your head drops, then, as I've said, you kind of start to second guess yourself. And you could see that in everything else that the Rowdies did. It wasn't just that, um, you know, the the disjointed feeling that you had. I had that too, Carlos. Trust me, it was it was uh, it was difficult to watch with Ariel <laughs> Martinez in the midfield there. But um, the other thing that I had to, uh, or the other thing that I noticed uh, about that, um, I have to bring it up because it leads to the second goal here uh you know we were trying or, or miami i should say they were trying to get down the left side uh several times and our players antley scarlet in the back there and uh, i believe it was hilton who was mostly on the right side we were all trying to do our best in terms of a defensive unit and uh, the defensive unit just fell apart it absolutely fell apart i know that connor antley had a very rough half with his, uh, you know, with his first ball that was misplayed to score for Miami to score their goal, but in in the rest of the game that he played, he was also just not marking very well. Uh, Janos Loba, the left back for Miami, he played the ball past Antley to a man that, as Leo had noted already, was running past Jordan Scarlett. Jordan Scarlett was not marking his man. Then that ball comes into Othello Ba. Othello Ball was at the top of the box and had absolutely no one anywhere near him. He could have taken a touch, he could have taken two touches before he got his shot off. He didn't actually in the end, but he had the time to do so. Um, this is just not something that you see with the Rowdies. Where was Lewis Hilton to mark Othello Ball? Why was, uh, why was the other midfielder, Lawrence White? Lawrence White came to this team originally as a defensive midfielder or a defender. Uh, when he was in MLS last season, he played as a center back or a right wing back. Um, that was where you know that was where he really showed himself enough to actually earn an MLS contract. If you're getting into this level and you're forgetting your defensive duties, what's going on here? That's got to come down to a real problem mentally. Uh, the Rowdies obviously are a very good defensive team. They have these very good defensive players. All of these guys have had some sort of MLS experience or another. Aaron Guillen comes from FC Dallas, where he was playing uh, a couple of games in MLS. Forrest Lasso had a couple of games for FC Cincinnati before he came to the Rowdies. Then, I, like I said, Lawrence Wyke was Jordan Scarlett was in the New York Red Bull system, and he was, you know, almost uh, almost getting on that first team. I thought it looked like he did very well the couple seasons that he was with them, and I was so happy when he came to us because he was such a good defender. Um, how are these guys who have such a good pedigree giving up all this space to these players that they know are so dangerous? There's got to be something going on where their heads are somewhere else in the game, and if your head is somewhere else, mm -hmm. then obviously it's going to lead to these problems of way just wide open players. And uh, we saw that uh, all over our defensive side for the first half. I, I can't, I, I, like I said, let's not beat everything to death and, you know, or hit the same point over and over, but <laughs> if it's the pattern that keeps showing up from one game to the next and we're covering two games, unfortunately, it's just going to sound that way, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're making all the right points, and I, I agree with you, you know, like I said, although it sounds like we're repeating ourselves, um, you know, even when we had a possession of the ball in that, um, in that second half, uh, Honestly, whenever the Miami FC would counter on us, it looked as if they were going to score more than when we had that possession in, in the second half. And, you know, um, I just want to quickly mention that Leo Fernandez goal, that was, uh, you know, it was it was a really good goal. Wouldn't be surprised if it was goal of the week. I just wish uh, that would have meant something more as in, like, a, a win. Because, you know, once again, you know, he, he was your man of the match uh, uh, last game, James, because you said he was just, you know, uh, creating chances and stuff like that. And I thought he was the only one that was actually uh, feeling like he was the only one that actually, to me, was very mad that they were down. He yeah. was yeah. getting annoyed. You know, he looked like the one that he was getting mad with his team that like, you know, like, yo, what the hell is wrong with y'all? You know, like, come on, we're better than this. And then once you've seen those subs come in the second half, 
you see him creating chances. You see him asking for the ball more. You know, he's mm-hmm. like enjoying his game even more. And then we talk about the side to side play that works so well for the rallies. And how, how do they score against the Miami FC? Literally from switching one ball to the other side and Leo Fernandez scores. You know, usually you see him cross something like that, but he, you know, it just shows that he felt that um, he needed to uh, lift the team up by himself just by scoring, you know, a goal. And maybe it was a shot of desperation or just, you know, just getting a, a, a shot on goal, you know, creating something out of nothing. And that's exactly what he did. And instead of celebrating, he just ran straight back to the midfield he asked for water i believe a water bottle on the <laughs> sidelines um but it just shows that uh, i'm ready to go you know let's, let's do this again come on just we still got energy in us and um you know it just for for him i think he looked like someone if we talk about how disjointed that first half was i think in that first half still he was still trying to make something you know he, he's the one that that uh, uh uh i believe created the opportunity for lawrence white to hit the post at least and he looked like someone who just really was annoyed and just wanted, you know, for the Rowdies to have some kind of reaction or some kind of threat going forward. Yeah, I would um, say that Leo was one of the more impressive players for the uh, Miami game overall. Again, uh, it was the case, like I said, for Hartford that I thought that he was the man of the match, but I don't know who else is going to step up around him is the problem here, and uh, that was that was one of the bigger things that I saw. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, subs coming on in the second half. So Sebastian Guinzotti came on for Dayon Harris. Sebastian Dalgard came on for Connor Antley. And, you know, Connor Antley, I hope that he'll just put this game out of his head, frankly. It was, it's not worth it to focus on because, it, you know, everyone's going to have an off day. And then Jan Ecker came on for Zach Steinberger, and that did seem to switch things up a little bit in terms of how Miami was able to control the game. They did not have as much... Um, they did not have as much possession or chances, and just to belabor that point a little, uh, if we look at halftime stats, the possession was 66 to 34 and for Miami. That's that's a ridiculous disparity. It was six to four shots for Miami. You know that's not too different. Different. Uh, 240 accurate passes to 111, also in terms of Miami. And then the uh, one of the other big statistics I saw was five successful dribbles to zero also for Miami. So I think all five of those were from Ariel (laughs) Martinez, but um, it it turns around when we bring those guys on. It was 51 to 49% possession after the game finished, so you have to think about how much possession the Rowdies had in the second half then. Mm -hmm. It turns out to uh, seven shots for Miami, 16 for the Rowdies, seven chances for Miami and 16 for the Rowdies naturally. And then, uh, you know, most of the other things were different. The one big thing, though, was still 9-2 to two in terms of successful dribbles for Miami. Um, mm-hmm. These are all, you know, these are all things that turned around by the second half. So does it come down to that the players are not working well in those positions? Or uh, is it just something that's a little refreshing to get going again in the second half? Um, I'm not entirely sure because, you know, they don't give up a second goal. Uh, or they don't give up an early goal, I should say, in the second half. Uh, maybe that is where the Rowdies have lost the most of their confidence over the course of these last couple of games where they did end up losing. Um, mm. It needs to, It's something that needs to be delved into, and it's something that the coaching staff needs to work on because there was such a huge disparity between the way that the players played in the first half and the way that the new team, so to speak, played in the second half. Mm. I need to understand, you know, uh, what was what was it that their heads dropped so low? Is it that is it that early goal? That's something that happens in soccer, and you got to be able to get over it. Is it just the case that you know you need to you need to bring some new players on and get uh, a fresh look, like more, a lot more frequently than we're getting in these games? I I would personally say that <laughs> that that sounds good to me. But um, yeah, it's just it's it was another one that was very tough to watch in the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. You know. Um... It's just I kind of feel bad um, for for uh, the the Ralphs mob for going to the game, but I hope besides the game they they had a they had a wonderful time, you know. Man, man, besides the game, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of fun things to do in Miami. But you know, I just want to quickly mention that they attended that game. Hopefully, it shines some light uh, for for Rowdy's fans. Um, and on the broadcast, I did actually hear the Ralphs mob, so that's something that's something uh, good that happened as well. But yeah. as far as on the pitch, <laughs> yeah. As far as on the pitch, I mean, we, we, we said it all, you know, like, um, 
what's going wrong with them uh why you know the a tale of two halves really uh one half that was poor the other half that showed a reaction but again when your two goes down um it's a high mountain to get over yeah exactly your two goes down you have a team like Miami who's in good form they're not going to make any silly mistakes like uh fortunately the Rockies did in the first half um they're gonna they're gonna sit back they're gonna make it difficult for you they're gonna make it really annoying for you and another thing is that you know uh I would say this game counts as double, one for points and one for bragging rights, you know, because it's a right. rivalry game between two of Florida teams. And fortunately, you know, we can make a case that uh, the Miami FC should have won that first time they played the Rowdies here at Outland Stadium. But, you know, luckily the Rowdies uh, escaped with the win that game. But they won the last two in a space of, I believe, 10 days. Um, you know, they were both games 2-1. And... I feel like I was more impressed with the Miami FC this game than it was last game because they just took control. And, um, you know, it just, the, the Miami FC, they, they, like I said, they made things difficult for Rowdies in that second half. And, you know, it seemed like they were comfortable making things difficult because all they had to do was sit back. They had a feeling that, like, most of the job was done in that first half. And they knew the Rowdies, they couldn't sit back anymore. They needed to get possession. They needed to um, attack more. And even after Leo Fernandez scored that first goal, um, Miami didn't change the way they played. They still stayed back. They were they're gonna even they were gonna ride on that one goal lead. And I don't wanna um <laughs> uh make uh make it more harsh for, for Rowdy's fans, but you know, um it's a painful week because another team sort of beat you. You know, another Florida team sort of beat you, you know. Uh the game against Hartford, uh Dodson, he's on loan from Orlando City. And uh well ultimately it turned out to be the game winning goal against the Miami MC. Uh, the the game winning goal was assisted by Pierre De Silva, who used to play for Orlando City. You know, so it's like you 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 got hit with double you got hit with the double whammy that you didn't really realize. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really tough in that in that sense too. You know, um, Miami right now is threatening to take over the season with a or or leave this season with a w- winning record over the Rowdies. Um, Mm -hmm. This is a team that doesn't have the full rights to their own name, you know, we have to call them (laughs) the Miami FC. Right now, this is a team. Stadium. Yeah, exactly. They have an awful stadium and on an awful pitch and, you know, I'm going to have to go there right now, but they had, I don't know, this was the game that they were welcoming back their fans. How many, how many Miami shirts did you see in the stands there? Like under 50 maybe? I've seen one small section with uh Miami fans and I was I kind of felt bad because I know most people are supporting the team in MLS but they're in dead last place right now and then this Miami team in the USL is on really good form so I feel for them but not really because I'm from Tampa (laughs) that's right that's right but like this is what this is what we mean you know the the team that we're dealing with they don't have two of their best players who are in the gold cup their fan base is kind of you know it's a it's a maybe a typical miami fan base i suppose they're kind of it's like someone kinda in and out the they got free tickets exactly exactly <laughs> so this is the team that we're dealing with and um, the rowdies are a better team we we know that they are a team that made the eastern conference championship last season they won that we have almost all of those players from last year, and then we, on paper, added to it. So what's going on here? There's mm-hmm. there's something that's going on, and we can't allow a team that is, you know, to put it one way, they're beneath us. We can't allow a team like Miami, who is beneath us, to get a winning record over us on this season. That's just unacceptable for me. And um, something needs to change in terms of how we get through from one week to the next. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess um, you know, uh, as all, as far as all that being said, um, this might be a little bit tough, maybe not. But I want to ask you, James, uh, who who was your man of the match for that uh, tough loss against um, the Miami FC? Well, I'm tempted to give it to Leo here. He did get the goal. Um, I'm tempted to give it to Evan Loro. Uh, I believe it was this game that he took one right in the face, and then oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he stopped a he stopped a shot with his face, and uh, almost had to. Uh, well, he at least had to do uh, the concussion protocol and all that. Um, I believe that was this one, and if I if I'm mistaken, then my apologies. But I think for this one, I'm gonna have to say Leo was probably my man of the match. He did work very hard, as you said. He got the goal. Mm-hmm. He he deserves it here. I'm gonna give it to Connor Antley. No, I'm kidding. I have to agree with you on Leo <laughs> Fernandez. Um, you know, he uh 
like you said, he just worked hard. Like we both said, he worked really hard. He looked like someone that, you know, does actually matter to him. He kept his head high. He tried to motivate others, and that goal just topped it off. And I just wish, you know, I feel like not only did the Rodgers deserve this win, but Leo Fernandez deserved it. This win and last win, you know. Um, he, he, he really put in um, a hard shift. He got a wonderful goal. If it doesn't win goal of the week, I'm going to uh, file a, a complaint to USL. <laughs> but, yeah, I will give it to Leo Fernandez. All right. Well, you know, we are we are in agreement there, so that's good. But uh, we do have more questions to get to, and uh, I will ask you this. You have it here. Um, this is something that we need to go over. Do you think that there is enough depth? Uh, I'll tell you really quickly. I, sa- I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you mentioned it earlier. I, I don't know exactly what you said, but you said something that, like, um, we got to change things up if the players we put in aren't performing well, you know. And we could talk about you put in other players, but in that first half, those were our other players, you know, the other players that came in to give other players rest. The main players, like, like uh, not main, but starting players like Winzati, you know, players like that to give them a little bit of rest. But, yeah, you put in out the Bio Smith, who doesn't really do, you know, he hasn't really had an impact. And then you talk about uh, Dayon Harris, uh, Connor Antley, Lawrence White. You know, and honestly, Lawrence White has, hasn't been the same ever since he had that knock. He hasn't been really as efficient as he was uh, early in the season. You know, so I don't think there's enough depth. And we know that we're going way back before the season even started, how all these signings are coming in. Um, you know, uh, uh, the Rowdies have all this depth. They can make a two uh, um, uh, five-star teams with, the, with, with all the players they got. Dos Santos was hurt. The Santos got her one of our new signings. Uh, Tejera still has yet to make an appearance. Like Kim Cosano still has yet to make an appearance. Um, I believe Luis Fernando. Fernando. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Luis Fernando. Uh, new signing still yet to make an appearance. And then you know you have these other players who who have you know who you got fans excited for, but you know have little impact. As I would say, you have all of them. I think Deion Harris probably impressed me the most, even though he doesn't really have goals or assists to show for it. Besides that, inspiring a uh, late cameo he had that one game. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> the short answer, no, I don't think right now there's not enough depth in this team. Yeah, and and if that's the case, then you know the next question is, do we need to um, change the formation? This is something that you and I have hit on. Uh, I don't know what three podcasts in a row for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tell me, tell said, me what you're thinking. Yeah, you said earlier that um, uh, it's not likely that that uh, a change will be made, but I believe there has to. You know. Um, switch to a back four, and you know, um, you go to it with the four three three or four two three one. I'll get more into that later. But for a short answer, I think there needs to be a formation change. You know, and you know, I've been hearing from the broadcasters, from people on Twitter, uh, that Neil Collins, you know, a player turned coach, someone a former player for the Rowdies, um, he establishes winning culture. But when you establish a winning culture, it doesn't mean you stick with the same formation every game. You know. You look at managers like, I know these are top world-class managers, but you look at managers like uh, Pep Guardiola, uh, Jurgen Klopp, um, uh, you know, managers like that, they don't stick with the same formation. You know, they, they adapt to keep that winning culture. But, you know, once teams start to figure you out, especially after winning the Eastern Conference, teams are going to want to figure you out. How, the, how They're going to start thinking, how can we knock you down? You know, uh, if you stick with the same formation, I think it makes it easier for teams that you know they're gonna know that you you rely on this uh, on this on this um on this foundation of playing this certain way, and I, that's why I think a, a, a change of formation is, is needed right now. Yeah, and um, this plays into one of the Twitter questions that we received. Again, if you mm-hmm. have any, please uh, let us know. You can go for uh, RBLR Sports on Twitter. You can you can hell you can just tag us. Um, let us know, and uh, <laughs> if not, the hashtag is AskRBLR. But one of them, from Ben Whitelaw, who does the RBLR Rays show. Please check that out, by the way, listeners. It's very good. Uh, he brings a lot of uh, in-depth coverage here, and along those lines, he said, based on XG, Rowdies have been the better team in the last two games, despite losing them both. And then he goes through that. Do you think that the team will make any tactical adjustments in the next match or continue to play their style and hope for better luck. So <laughs> this is another thing that we have inadvertently answered before, I think. Um, we, we are both of the opinion at this point that something needs to change in terms of the formation. And uh, we're not getting enough attacking players involved in the game, probably because there are, you know, when we have the ball, because there are three players at the back usually. And I know, as I said, 
um, when we do have possession, our formation usually morphs into a 4-4-2, but um, the way that we play it, it's often the case that Forrest Lasso will still sit back, and if one of these players needs to either switch position or possibly go off, you know, I think that we need to do that so that we have more players who are actually in the uh, in our attacking positions and they can provide support to Sebastian Guanzotti when he's trying to get the ball or whoever it is that's around him. Um, do I think that that's going to happen? No. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, we said it. Um, yeah, that we neither of us think it's gonna happen, you know, because um, if it was supposed to happen, it would have happened already, you know. You exactly. Had a second loss, uh, Miami would have been the game where he changed things up, and nope, didn't happen. So to answer uh, Ben's question, you know, uh, I, I don't see that happening. I think they're continuing to play the way they they they're doing right now. Um, not necessarily hope for better luck, but try to bring back that confidence and the way that they've been winning in that formation as in getting the wingbacks more involved but bringing Guanzotti um both in the middle of the play and also uh in the right positions and also give Lewis Hilton you know uh, more opportunities on the ball and hopefully get players like uh, uh Lawrence Wyke uh Connor Antley back in form because we knew we knew we both know how, how good they, they were doing the start of the season so uh I think that's what going. That's what's going on in Neil Collins' mind more than considering a formation change. Yeah, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But um, we have one more Twitter question. We're going to get through that before we get uh, to our last two questions that we had set up for ourselves. And this is from at Davy from Tampa. Um, do the Rowdies need to go back to the basics? Poor shots, lackluster chances created. To my memory, no meaningful one twos played. What's wrong? And um, yeah, I, I, I've mentioned I think that the confidence is a big problem right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that the formation is not helping us get through this rough patch that is a lull in our confidence. So I'm hoping that both of those things change. And then, well, <laughs> I hope one of those things changes because I don't think that one, I don't think the other will. But um, one thing that we can look to is who's going to start. So um, who do we want to see starting on the right side? Harris and Dahlgaard and Antley have all played there. Who do we want to see on the left? Leo has done a very good job, and I think that he should probably stay there. Uh, maybe bring in Dahlgaard on as a late sub, as we have seen. And then who is going in the number 10 between Matthew Serbel and Zach Steinberger? These are all big questions right now, Leo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to uh, answer um, excuse me, David's uh, question real quick, um, I think the Rodgers did try to go back to the basics against Miami. They just shot themselves in their own foot with that uh, Connor Antley mistake. You know, they uh, they tried to defend more than possess the ball and hit him on the counter. It didn't work because, like I said, they shot themselves in their own foot. But um, maybe they'll go back to the basics again or, you know, because they're facing a team like uh, Loudon United, who we'll get, we'll get into more uh, shortly. Uh, they won't return to the basics for this game at least. They'll probably want to be the more dominant team and the team that creates more chances. But as far as, you know, who starts, uh, you know, the battle between Sir, Sir Bell and Steinberger and uh, the players we have on the right side. As far as the number 10 position, I liked what I seen from Sir Bell, you know, uh, when, when against Hartford. The, 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 the slick passes, the, the quick movements, the quick touches, something that I have yet to see from Steinberger. But when Steinberger came in in that Hartford game, he changed the game too. So I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, like, what if you start Sir Bell for one more game and then sub on Steinberger, you know? Because I feel like that game, Steinberger knew that he could be replaced, so he showed a little bit of more urgency that I have, you know, I, honestly, I've only seen a few times this whole season. So for me, uh, I feel like I would start Sir Bell in, in the purpose of making Steinberger a better number 10. You know, um, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> I would, I would. That's that's kind of the call that I would make too. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it is not the case that I have any say over that. Or you know, if it turns out all good in the end, maybe maybe it's fortunate that I have no say. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, as far as on the right side, um, Connor Antley, I know. Uh, people always say that professionals move on the day after, but I think that one still guts him a little bit, especially considering how he hasn't been starting. He gets a start back, and he uh, makes that mistake. And then, you know, earlier in the season, he was just firing on all cylinders. And he's facing dip in form. Pretty sure he's facing a little bit different confidence. He needs to get that back. Uh, Dayon Harris, he's been doing really good. I think Neil Collins likes him more up top, although I'll prefer him out wide. I like how he takes on players instead of just staying, staying central. Uh, when he does go out wide, he, he does really good. But um, 
who who I would want to start is Deion Harris on the right wing back, but I think he's gonna stay forward. So and Dalgard, he's been doing good recently. You know, he's been doing his duties as a casual uh, uh, right winger, just taking on players, uh, doing your casual defensive duties, and putting crosses in the box. So I would want to start Deion Harris, but I think um, Neil Klons will start Dalgard on the right. Yeah, um, I am. This is another one. Uh, your explanation is roughly the same of what I would have said, so <laughs> I'm gonna go. Uh, pretty much the same conclusion too. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, we have one more thing to quickly point out is that uh, you know, like I said, from a neutral standpoint, this is probably a really good game. You know, uh, mistakes you don't see often in soccer. Uh, two rival sides. We've seen a couple pushes from Dalgard. Um, you know, uh, intense. It was an intense game. Um, I think uh, we can expect this rivalry to continue, especially. Uh, that that the Miami FC had beaten the Rowdies twice back to back, so now it's gonna be a chip on the shoulder for the Rowdies to reestablish that they're the best team, the best Florida team in USL. So yep. I think uh, we'll continue to expect to see these kind of games. Yeah, I agree with that too. I think that as long as Miami sticks around, this is gonna turn out into uh, you know a typical Tampa Miami rivalry, and uh, everybody likes that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, that is gonna lead us to our hot take of the week. And I mentioned it a little bit earlier before, but um, my hot take of the week is if Neil Collins does not change the formation to either a 4-2-3 or 4 3 one or some kind of back four formation, uh, I believe that the Rodgers will continue to go winless. Maybe not this upcoming game this Saturday because they are playing the the the, um, <laughs> the team in last place. But uh, I think they will continue to go winless and have more trouble winning games because uh, from what I've seen this season, the 3-5-2 is so reliant on Dos Santos playing, and when you have him out the picture, you know, you have someone like Deion Harris, Jordan Adabao Smith, who don't have the same um, traits as he does, so it kind of makes it, you know, harder to replicate uh, the form you started in the beginning of the season. However, if you um, switch to a four, I'm going to just go four two three one. you know, you, I mentioned it in, in a podcast earlier uh, uh, in the season that uh, you have Aaron Gee on the left, on the left back, you know, you're, you have Scarlett and, um, Forrest Lasso, the center backs, uh, Connor Antley on the right back. Defensive mids, Lewis Hilton and Jordan Doherty at the number 10 role. Uh, you could, I would start Sabell right now. On the left, you have Fernandez. On the right, you have Deion Harris. And up top, you go with Sebastian Guanzotti, you know. And if things not working right, you have the options to putting out about Smith rather than starting him. You know, maybe because we all know how good he was in the cameos he made in the beginning of the season. However, you know, that will give him more. It will give him more eagerness to get a goal, maybe even potentially be a game-winning goal, and you have more energy coming in later on. So I just think a 4 3 one will work great for the Rodgers right now. Yeah, well, uh, I, I got I to gotta give it to you for your hot take, Leo, because my hot take was to switch up the defense and play with four in the back. So uh, <laughs> we, we appear to be firing on all the same cylinders tonight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and this is going to take us to our standings update. You know, uh, it's a good one. Good thing is that James and I have been James and I have been agreeing on most of the things. So, if you want to see it as a good thing, Rodgers fans take it as a good thing. But um, <laughs> before I bring a little bit of bad news, not too much bad news, but um, the Rodgers standings for our standings update, the Rodgers remain in first place in the Atlantic Division with 24 points from 13 games, but they are only in first because of goal difference. Pittsburgh Riverhounds have 24 points from 13 games. No, I think it's 14 games, actually. Yeah, 14 games, so the Rodgers do have a game in hand. You know, uh, you might think that's good news. However, they are on thin ice for keeping that first-place spot, which means there's no more room for dropping points, not even tying. They need to start. They need to replicate that winning form they had in the beginning of the season because if they continue to drop points, uh, Pittsburgh might catch up to them. Or, you know, we look at Hartford Athletic, who are in four points. I mean, who are in fourth place with 20 points. Although that might not sound threatening, uh, they do have a, only 11 games played, so they have three games in hand. If they win those three games, or even two of those games, they go above the Rowdies. And we lost it on 1-0 earlier uh, last week, so that's something to keep an eye out on. Um, as far as the Eastern Conference in general, the Rowdies dropped out of first place. Uh, Louisville City FC are now uh, uh, the, front runner, the front runners. They are now in first place. They have 26 points from 13 games. And uh, Phoenix have 26 points from only 12 games. So that's nothing to keep an eye on. You know, they have games in hand. So, um, you know, the Rowdies, there, like I said, they're running on thin ice. There's no more rooms. You know, you had uh, a few uh, uh, chances to, you know, maybe not win, maybe take one point here and there. But now it's a time to not drop any point. Any, now, is not, now is not the time to drop any more points. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. So, mm -hmm. um, with all of that said, we will go into a very quick preview. There is a game coming up this Saturday at 7.30 at Al Lang. I will be able to go. So I'm going to be bringing all of my uh, my screaming self to cheer on the Rowdies. <laughs> but um, the good news is we are playing the last place team in our division. Loudoun United is, like I said, in last place. They only have six points from 12 games so far. And uh, as you said, Leo, if they don't win, they're in serious trouble. This is serious, a really good trouble. game for them to bounce back. There's a bounce back mm -hmm. factor that they really need right now, especially considering the circumstances that we have described mm -hmm. all, uh, all this episode with their confidence. So um, we're going to move on from that and try not to get into, you know, this player did that and that player did this and just get right into our predictions here. Um, I'm going to give it to you, Leo, to decide. <laughs> Do you want to go first, or do you want to let me go first? We've had a, um, we haven't had a great deal of luck one way or another recently. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll take the first stab at it. Um, I think uh, playing in front of your home crowd, looking to regain that confidence back. I'm gonna go with a uh, a two zero win for the Rowdies. Uh, Gwenzadi brace. You know you've done this to me twice now. I've let you pick twice, <laughs> or I've let you pick first recently, and you've taken my I mean, you've taken my prediction. So I guess I gotta I gotta let that one go. And instead of that. I'm going to go even farther out the gate. I'm going to say 3-0. We're going to have a 3-0 okay. no win. Yeah. And uh, that's that's also what I'm hoping for, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to go at this game. It's my sister's birthday. So uh, hopefully I'll have, uh, have the game on uh, in the background where I can keep an eye on it because I'm really looking forward to this game. I hope the Riders can bounce back. But um, with all that being said, is there anything uh, else you, you want to say, James? I think at this point, the last thing for us to say is thank you, listeners, for tuning in yet again. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. Thank, thank you, listeners. And as always, uh, follow us at RBLR Sports on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at underscore Leo Santos underscore underscore James uh, can and where can and where can these people uh, follow you on on social media? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at rblrjamesk. I am uh, trying to get into being on there more often so that I can see everything. Please get in touch with me. Let me know mm -hmm. if you have questions, and that way I'll remember, okay, I need to get back to this guy. Let me go check out what's going on with the Rowdies. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let, um, get, get in touch with me, and uh, hashtag askrblrworks too. Yeah, and yeah, definitely uh, ask us questions. Don't, don't, don't hesitate to. We'll, we'll get them done on the show. And, um, but yeah, uh, like and subscribe to our podcast. We're on Spotify, the iHeartRadio app, Apple and Google Podcasts, YouTube, and other major podcast platforms. And from James and I, uh, you know, um, come on, you rowdies. Let's help you bounce back. And as always, go rowdies. Go rowdies. Thank you for tuning into this presentation by RBLR Sports. On your way out of the stadium, please remember to like and subscribe.